If you have your Bible, or you want to go grab it real quickly, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 9. And such a beautiful text. Want to know what I've been reading lately, by the way? I've been reading Matthew chapter 9 over and over and over and over and over again. Matthew chapter 9 is so good. I'm going to read this Matthew 9 verses 35 through 38. And if you need something to study this week, uh, maybe for the next few weeks, you can park yourself inside of Matthew chapter 9 and then go into Matthew chapter 10. And it's so rich with Christology, what Christ did, how Christ is moving, what Christ's heart was for us. And it's so good. I'll read this one. Verse 35, it says, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area. Bible says, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. My favorite verse may be in the entire Bible. That's the strong statement maybe in the entire Bible. 36 says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So good. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers, the laborers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. I want to preach, teach today and kind of tell you a story around the big idea, the thematic thrust of I want it. To quit. I want it to quit. Let's pray one more time. Father, in Jesus' name, as I preach and teach this today, would you allow this to touch everyone who's watching? Maybe the one who's at home who is hiding behind the screen and they have so much sorrow, so much anguish, so much stress, so much fear, so much anxiety, so much sin, and they don't know which way to go. Somewhere in this, would you give them a piece of bread that they can feed from heaven? I don't know anything. You know everything. So I submit myself to you in this moment that you would do what only you can do and do it good. We pray these prayers today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's do it, church. Um, Today we're starting a brand new sermon series that is entitled 911. Sure, maybe it's inspired by that hit show that was on Fox a few years ago, 911, one of my favorite shows of all times, by the way. And uh, we'll spend the next few weeks teaching, preaching, digging deep into the scriptures and to find out what parts of the text, what does 911 mean for the church right now? What does it mean for the body of Christ as we sit, as we're seated right now in the middle of this pandemic and how it um, how it looks for us? As we enter into this teaching today, I wanted to quit. Let me give you some backstory. It was one Saturday evening around 536 p.m. I am outside cutting the grass because the grass had gotten so high and I had gotten so busy with life and doing life and church and work of the church and being a dad, being a husband, that my grass had gotten so high, it was almost embarrassing, y'all. And so I went out one Saturday evening and I went out to go cut the grass. Now, keep in mind, it wasn't that hot, wasn't that cool. And it was just me and God. Typically, when I cut the grass, I had my earbuds in. And when I have the earbuds, I can listen to like a song, worship, a podcast, a sermon, and I can kind of have some motivation while I'm doing the hard task of pushing the lawnmower to get that thing done. Uh, lo and behold, while I'm outside with nothing in my ear, I begin to feel this overwhelming feeling of defeat, uh, this overwhelming feeling of failure. So much so, I begin to almost weep as I finish cutting the grass. Long story short, 
I walk into the house, I'm a mess, I go hop in the shower real quick, I then come back downstairs to come and eat dinner with the family, and that night we was having hamburgers, with che well cheeseburgers with cheese on them, and I was so <laughs> pumped to eat food that night. In the process though, I found myself in a posture of completely weeping, almost in tears. Now this happens to me often. I tell everyone that I typically, I'll cry right now more than I've ever cried in my entire life. Think about how God's been good to me, I'll shed a tear. Think about a, a fear, I'm not unsure about something, I'll shed a tear. Um, and so I'm at the point of almost shedding a tear. My wife, Lady Key, asked me, babe, what's wrong? I just took my, shook my head, nothing, nothing, I'm good. Meanwhile, we're eating, I'm not saying much of anything, it's this awkwardness going into the kitchen table. Key is looking like, why dad not being typical regular dad? Uh, Key want to know what's wrong with me. And lo and behold, I tell her, babe, I, I feel like quitting. Quitting what you say? Quitting my posture and my seat as a leader of the church at Growth Church. Now, before you go too far and say, man, well, why? What's up with that? Let me explain further. Um, you also could be thinking, saying, well, what happened? Did something happen? No, nothing happened. Nothing more than when pandemic hit us, right? It was March 6th was our last time partaking in worship together. And so pandemic hit us. We're trying to see what's going on. How are things going? What's going to happen next? How are the members of the church? Um, are we ever going to meet in person again? And it was all this chaos going on. My posture was one to check on everyone from church. OK, are they fine? They need food. Um, are they OK? That was first. Number two, it was how do we keep going and keep growing the way that we were before pandemic hit us? See, the, the Sunday that pandemic hit us and we cannot go back to church, we were supposed to baptize, I think, four or five people that Sunday who had said, Jesus Christ is my savior. Long story short, we cannot do that. And so in the process of that, I found myself looking for a result from God, looking for a result, looking for a type of profit. Um, anyone here who, who leads an organization has a small business. Um, maybe you have a pie shop, maybe you have, I don't know, anything, an online business shop or something of that nature. You're always looking for a profit and in church and leading the church, there is nothing that begets and that says, is the church profitable? Is it doing good or is it doing bad? Except for the reality of salvations and people confessing Christ to be their Lord and to be their Savior. Long story short, I knew that on the inside. And I'm thinking, man, we've been doing this for months. We've been going hard. We've been going from kind of place to place. We go to a farm, have worship. We go to a studio, have worship. We go to a kitchen, have worship. Like we was doing anything and everything to one, be creative. Number two, keep the church engaged as we really did not have and still don't have a physical location. Okay, we fast forward from that. And then I'm trying to think to myself, man, well, we're not seeing a result. Sure, are people logging online and are they engaged? Yes, they are. But anyone who is driving something, steering something, we're always looking for a type of result or a type of profit. All of my people out there who are business owners, come in for a second. I believe that every single pastor in the world has a niche. It's kind of the space where they can, where they have some extra anointing on, the space that they can kind of do a little bit more on. I think God's given me three. Uh, one is marriage. That's one space I think God's given to me. Other space is leadership. Other space is small business owners. And we call that marketplace ministry. And so, for example, if you had a small business and you were not turning a profit, let's say, for example, you had a pie shop and you was making 500 pies a week and you was working 60 hours a week and you uh, it cost you two thousand dollars to run the business for the course of the week. And it was all said and done. You only brought in two thousand two hundred dollars. It don't take much math to know you only made 200 bucks in profit. And so how long would you run that business model without saying something, something just ain't right in the words of Keith Sweat. <laughs> and so note takers, write this down. 
Salvations are to the church what profits are to businesses. Salvations are to the church what profits are to small businesses. You then take that dialogue and you say, well, PT, how, how are we going to do that? And it brings me to the text for the day, the focus, where Jesus so beautifully says in Matthew 9, 37, Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers and the workers are few. What does he mean when he says that? He means that the number of people out there in Fredericksburg, in Spotsy, in Stafford, in Caroline, in your neighborhood, by the way, in your phone log, contacts in your iPhone, the harvest out there is great, it's plentiful, but the laborers sometimes can be few. And all that we really want to know is, are we being profitable or are we not? Mark 8, 36 says, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his soul? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his soul? My first question for the day is simply this. Are you profitable? Yeah, are you profitable? Is the thing that you're doing in life, is it getting you a result? Uh, the organization that you lead, maybe you own a small business, maybe you don't, but is your life right now profitable? Is it making sense? Are you getting results or are you not? That is the big focus and question for the day because typically when anybody wants to quit and give up on anything in life, it is because they're not seeing any results. Go and research from the highest achievers in the world to the lowest ones. Typically, the reason that somebody quits is because I'm not seeing a result. And if I don't see a result, I can go invest my time, energy, and efforts someplace else. And I've come to challenge you as I've been challenging myself, where does God want me to be profitable at? Where does God want us as a church to be profitable at? How do we proceed in 2020 going into 2021 being profitable? That is the focus for today. As we transition into the text for the day, this particular pericope of text, Matthew 9, is so pregnant with preaching and teaching possibility. In fact, I mentioned before, I have read this chapter every single day for the past couple of weeks, every single day taking notes. It is in this particular text. I brought my personal uh, journal from home that in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus Christ does more in this chapter than some people do in a lifetime. Get that. He does more in this chapter than most people do in a lifetime. I'll explain why. In Matthew chapter 9, verse number 2, Jesus sees a paralyzed man on the mat and he heals him. He heals his soul first and forgives his sins. Then he forgives his condition from him being paralyzed. In verse number nine, he is also out in the community. He's recruiting people. Verse number nine, he goes to recruit Matthew, the tax collector. Verse number 10, Matthew throws Jesus Christ a party at his house and the Lord shows up at Matthew's crib having a good time eating and conversing and having fun with some people there who were, skin, who were sinners. He also then defends himself in Matthew chapter 9 verse 12 when they ask him, Matthew, why does this dude you hang with Jesus if he's so perfect and such a the savior, why does he eat with such scum? He defends himself against that. And then in verse number 18, Jairus, who was a temple leader, he runs to the Lord and says, Jesus, Jesus, listen, my daughter at home and she is dead. Can you come help me? Verse number 20, as he is on the way to heal and to, to heal the dead girl, the lady with the issue of blood sneaks up behind him and touches the hem of his garment. <laughs> Then he goes, verse number 25, he gets to Jairus' house. When he gets there, he says, where is she? The people begin to laugh at Christ and say, she's dead. What are you doing here? He tells everybody to get out. He goes inside of her room. He raises her from the dead and he completely heals that girl. Verse number 29, he heals two blind men who were saying, Jesus, Jesus, we want to be able to see. He then heals those two blind men. He told them that famous text. He says, according to your faith, 
be it unto thee. In verse number 32, he keeps on going. He then goes and he heals a demon possessed man who is also mute, who cannot talk. I told you in Matthew chapter nine, the Lord does more ministry and more work and gets more results than the average person gets in their entire lifetime. What's the big point, PT? Where, where, are, you, where are you going? You've been going for two weeks. You're back. Where are you going with this? I'm glad you asked. In verses 35, 36, 37, and 38, we see Jesus doing what he does best. Bible says he traveled through all the towns and the villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. As a church, as a person, as an individual, who are the people that God is talking about in this particular text? It is anyone who needs a touch from God. It, it is anyone who finds themselves in a shortage where they are lacking the presence of God. They don't have the power of God. Maybe they are on the margins. Maybe they are the forgotten about. It is anyone in the Bible, in the world that is walking around today that does not have Christ in their lives? In fact, uh, I took a two day sabbatical. First one I ever took in my entire life. I took I took two days and I went to a hotel downtown Fredericksburg and it was just me, my Bible, my journal. And it was me asking and begging God, God, what is next for the church? How, how does it look? What do you want to do with your church? This thing does not belong to me. This is yours. And so sometimes we can be in the ball game doing the work on the field and forget what coach told us when the game first began. And so I had to go away and get away from doing the work of the church, being a husband, being a daddy, working and just say, God, what are you saying to me for the church? And I'm going to ask, we'll have some footage and B roll in here about how that day went down. But while I was there, I began to ask God, particular text, who are the people who you want us to have compassion on? Who are the folks in the region of Fredericksburg? that you want us to have compassion on. And y'all, he gave me 12. And I'm gonna call each one out and here they are. It is everyone who is sick, sick mentally, sick physically, having ailments. God wants us to have compassion for the people who are sick. He also wants to have compassion for the people who find themselves in debt. Uh, there are people who are trying to keep up with the Joneses. There are people who are robbing God, not returning a tithe and giving an offering, and yet they're trying to get ahead, and they're trying to play this game of, I can beat God's system and go out and do it my own way, like Frank Sinatra, and they're losing, and they find themselves in so much debt, and they find themselves being so messed up, and they need relief and help from debt. Who, who else did God put in my heart in their hotel room? Everyone who is an addict. And I can, I can testify a little bit about this. When I found myself in college and undergrad, I became to be an addict to alcohol. And I was a slave to drinking over and over and over again. But these are the people here, the addicts that people have forgotten about so much. So they feel like you're not holy. You can't do anything. You got that addiction and they throw people away. What God is saying here, when he went throughout that city, throughout that town, he saw the people and he had compassion on them. It is people who are addicts. In addition to it is everyone who suffers from homelessness. They have no place to call home. They need help. Who are we going to go and help? People who are homeless. This one was a hot topic in 2020, and it still is, by the way. Everyone who suffers from racism, everyone who feels because your skin color is that color or is that color that you are insignificant or you are less than me. It is people who are out here and they view your skin color as not being that great. People have to work through racism. 
And people say all the time, well, PT, they said that, and that person said that, they said that, they call me this word and that word, and I say, man, I know I'm as angry as you are. I'm as salty as you are. And with that, it's not the person, it's a heart thing. If you cannot tell me if they would get the power of God in their heart and receive salvation in Christ Jesus, they would do with them things. They would not do that. And so it's everyone who is also a racist. People who are at home and who suffer from loneliness. They're alone and they're hurting and they're aching. People who are lonely as well. Um, another hot topic in America right now, people who are headed to divorce. And they say, I married this person, I married this girl, this dude, and it ain't working out. I can't stand them. And they are about to throw in the towel. Who's going to go and rescue them? Who? Who's going to do it? By the way, if you drive on Route 3 in our city, you will see a sign every couple of miles that will say, you can get divorced for $99.99. And so what is America coming to when you can break apart someone's marriage for 100 bucks? Who's going to go and save these people? What about the folks who are suffering from poverty? What about these people? They don't eat well, don't have money. They make so little money. Who is going to go and get these people? What about the folks who are in prison and jails? Inmates. They're oftentimes forgot about. Inmates. Who is going to go help them? What about the folks who's about to go and be an inmate and they are criminals? Who's going to go and help them? Maybe they have an issue or problem with stealing stuff or taking stuff or robbing things or doing things illegal. What about those folks? Who is going to love on those people as well? What about the people who have mental disorders and they have anxiety, PTSD, depression, all these things in their lives and they have these disorders in their lives. And then another one, those who are facing suicide. And they're having thoughts about, man, I'm going to kill myself. I don't like me. I don't like who I've become. And they're sitting at home, and they could be watching this today, by the way. And they're contemplating, is it worth living tomorrow? And so when we have pandemic going on, we have people who are shut in their homes, and they cannot do life like they were doing life, and things are happening in life, there are people who says, I would rather be dead than to be alive. The question becomes, who is going to save those people. Back to the text, the Bible then says, Jesus said, the harvest is great. When he says harvest there, y'all, what he simply means is, it is all the people on those sheets of paper. That is the harvest. The harvest is great. The number of people that I know and that you know that are kin to you, you work with them, you know them, live in your neighborhood, who suffer from those things, we all know at least probably 20, 30, 40, if not 50 people who have those particular issues right now. And what Jesus said that when he saw those people, he had compassion on them. And so what does God want us to do as a church, to be an effective, to be a profitable church? What do we do as a church? We go find a way to go get those people. Why do we call this sermon series 911? Because the fact of the matter is, if we do not go and rescue these people, it could be too late someday. When he says the harvest is great, it's because anyone here who is a, a gardener or a planter, you know that when the harvest is ready to be picked, if you do not go and pick the harvest out, if you don't go pull the tomatoes, the cucumbers or the thing off the vine in the next day or two, it is going to rot and it is going to die. And when he says the harvest is great, it's because if we don't go get those people and begin to care about those people and take it as urgency in 911, those people are going to rot and going to be too late. And so what is the job of the church is to go be profitable and to go get and go help those people. I'll then end the story I began with that same Saturday night, 
that I said, man, I, I feel like it's not working. I feel like just quitting somewhere and not doing it no more. It was because there was no profit for me to see. There was no results for me to see. We are a two-year-old church about to be January 27th. Our first year, we baptized a dozen people. We have folks saying that Christ is my king. We could see the results tangibly. And we went to online church and we could not see any results. Furthermore, don't know if you know this, but I take no income from leading this church. When God put on my heart four and a half, five years ago, God told me, just do it. Take no money. Paul was a tent maker made income. I do other things to make income. And so when I'm here, if I'm not here earning a paycheck, typically if you get a paycheck, maybe that could make you feel okay. But for me, the only way that I get paid is when somebody gets saved. In fact, it was that very next Sunday morning. And I was like, man, somebody got to get saved. We got to see a result. Something has got to happen that very next day. We had two people say that Christ is my Lord and they gave their lives to him. I began to overwhelm so much. I was crying like I just lost somebody that I care about. He just died. I was crying so much. I had to get up from watching church with the family and go upstairs by myself. Why? Because my heart is for people who say, come into my heart and save me, Jesus. My heart is for people who are far from him. My heart is for the people that I just showed you on these 12 yellow squares that God gave me in the hotel. And so we will forever be as a church, a church that is committed to going to help people who are far from God, encounter him, and number two, multiply what we're doing. So here is what you can do to help be a part of what God is saying to our house. Four things. Number one, you can take full responsibility. Take full responsibility of what, PT? Of everyone that you encounter day by day, week by week, month by month, who are aching and who are far from Christ. Take full responsibility to get Christ to those people. Number two, develop a personal relationship with these people. Don't just come and say, well, you know I'm saved, I'm better than you are. No, go and develop a relationship with these people. Love on these people and just see how you can be a friend, how you can meet a need, how you can serve, how you can love them and go and develop a relationship with these people. The third thing you can do is go share your personal story. What has God done for you? How has he set you free? How has he healed you? What has he done for you? And go tell everybody about what God has done in your life. It used to be old school church. We would do old school testimony service and it would last probably an hour to an hour and a half. And they would testify all day long and they will begin every single one by saying, first give an honor to my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. And they will testify for a long time. I'm now asking you church, to go and testify and go and share your story with everyone that you encounter that needs the presence of God. And then lastly, give them a personal invitation to Jesus. If you don't know how to do that or you can't do that, simply invite them to church on Sundays. Listen, y'all, we spend a great amount of time preparing for this worship experience every single week. And if you would like to invite someone to church over these next five, six, seven weeks, it is going to be an opportune time that you can invite anyone that you care about. They may not be churched, by the way, that you can invite them to the presence of God via our online worship experiences. There are some sermon series that are really heavy and deep and, and spiritual and over the top that it would take a mature Christian to understand. And then there are some like this. It's so simple. It's nothing fancy about it that anyone could get this. And so my question for you today is, who does God want you to go talk to? Who does God want you to go talk to? I think the time of us being selfish and of us being consumers and just going to the buffet to eat and to eat and to eat and to eat, it's over. If we don't make a move now, if you don't go and talk to that person now, it could be too late because it was Jesus who said, the harvest is great, but the labors are few. He then says, so pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send workers into his field. And so I'm asking, will you be someone that are going to the field, that are go help those who are lost? 
And I'm not saying that you're going to you're going to become a preacher or a pastor overnight. No, all I'm saying is there's people who are aching, who are hurting, who's far from Christ today. And if you would simply go and talk to them and be with them and be a friend to them, share your story and invite them to the um, presence of God, they will likely be saved. And so I hope that somewhere in this story, God has spoken to your heart. Nothing fancy, nothing over the top. Just a simple uh, note from my heart to you, church, that the time for us to sit back and be passive in our Christianity is over. And so we've been praying, asking, begging God for two things, salvations and multiplications. And so as a church together, we can do it together. And so I want to pray a prayer over you today as I would literally commission you to go and care about those who are away from God. I want to pray for you. Number two, I want to pray for you if you're here today and you're saying, well, I, I am the person. <laughs> it's me. Pastor Tim, it's me. I'm a trip. I'm messed up. I'm a sinner. I'm an addict. I am thinking about killing myself. I am thinking about doing something crazy. I need the help. It is me. And so we have no, uh, no embarrassment, no shame towards you. We're here for you. The fact that we keep on doing this, this, by the way, is week 34 of doing this virtually. We keep showing up so that people like you can encounter the Savior who can heal every wound in your life. And so it's two people. Either I'm going to commission you to go and help somebody this week, or number two, you're here and you need Christ for yourself. So I want to pray first for the person who does not know who Jesus is. So Father, in Jesus' name, the person who is watching right now who do not know who you are that intimately, and they've kind of fallen back from you a little bit, and they've kind of said, I don't need God that much. But now they're saying today, I want to make Jesus my Lord and my Savior, and I want to reconnect with him. I want to have him come into my heart to save me, to heal me, to free me from these life that I live to help me and to bless me. Very simple. Lift your hand in your home, in your bedroom, in your kitchen. Lift that hand and say, Jesus, I need a savior. You are the only one who can save me. Say this, I'm a sinner and I pray that you would forgive me of my sins. Say, Jesus, I open the doors of my heart and today I am inviting you in to be my Lord and my Savior. And just say very simply, Jesus, save me today. Jesus, save me today. And if you've prayed that prayer, I believe, according to Romans, that if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, that God raised his son, Jesus Christ, from the dead just for you, that you'll be saved. And so if you prayed that prayer, simply respond below and say, this is my day. This day, by the way, is better than your birthday. Go shorty, it's your birthday. This is better than your birthday. The day that you said, Jesus, come into my heart, save me. I need you. If that's your day today, say below in the comments, this is my day. Number two person, if you're here and say, I already know who God is, PT, I'm good. Well, you're sitting back and should go get on the field and go start working. And so I'm praying for you at home right now in Jesus name that you would have the power of Holy Spirit living on the inside of you so much so that when you encounter someone who needs to feel, who needs to feel the love of Christ, that he would convict you in your spirit. That when you see that man, that woman, or that boy, or that girl, and they are far from God, that Holy Spirit will let you know that that is the one. So I pray that you would have power from Holy Spirit that you would go from being someone who is sitting back, living this life, that you would be on the battlefield saying, God, how do I get people saved for you? How do I do the work of the church for you? 
How do I help someone from hurting themselves or help someone who's in poverty or help someone who has mental issues or disorders? How can I help that person? So I pray that you would have power from the Holy Spirit because Christ said that greater work shall we do in Jesus name. I call you blessed. I call you happy. I call you whole and I call you on fire for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So those two people today, God bless you. We love you. I love you. And newsflash, I'm not going to quit. <laughs> I'm committed to this. I'll live by die for this. And all I'm saying is while we're here, church, we're going to be profitable. And we're going to let salvations go crazy in our church. So much so that we'll be people who care about what God cares about and will be the hands and feet of Christ in this region and the world abroad at some point. So God bless you, church. Thank you for worshiping with us today online for week 34 of Virtual Church Online. I love you. I miss you. God bless you. God is with you. You have the favor of God on you. And I'm going to speak a blessing over you as we all go today. Father, bless every viewer at line to, at online today. Help them. Keep them safe this week and all week long. Cover them, I pray, in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, church. Amen.